Operative outcomes of minimally invasive esophagectomy using prone VATS. Um, the presenter is uh, Dr. Goldberg uh, with co-authors Bowers, Parker, Stouffer, uh, Ospin, and Dan Smith from the Mayo Clinic, uh, Jacksonville. I want to thank the panel uh, for letting us present today. I have no, nothing to disclose. Minimally invasive esophagectomy is performed through various approaches, including the use of video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, or VATS, for mediastinal esophageal dissection. Typically, VATS is performed with patients in the lateral decubitus position, requiring numerous trocars, specialized retractors, and a skilled assistant. More recently, a prone VATS approach has been described, which may be advantageous over the standard decubitus positioning as it allows for fewer ports, gravity-aided retraction of the lung, and removal of pooling blood and fluid from the camera field. The purpose of our study was to review perioperative outcomes after prone MIE, focusing on the outcomes related to the patient's preoperative comorbidities. Our design was a retrospective cohort study from our single institution center. This is going on its own. Um, between January 2007 and August 2010, 42 patients underwent three-field MIE using the prone VATS technique. A three-trocar technique was used, allowing for just one surgeon and one assistant. All of the patients were managed with a standardized care pathway. This image represents standard pores placements for the prone VATS approach. You getting it? The patients were predominantly male with an average age of 68 years. The majority of, this is going, I'm not touching anything. Majority of patients had either Barrett's with high grade dysplasia or esophageal cancer. Two patients had benign disease, which was end stage achalasia with mega esophagus. 38% of the patients received neoadjuvant chemo and radiation therapy. A well established comorbidity stratification system, the modified Charleston Comorbidity Index, was used to classify the patients into low, moderate, and high risk groups. The Charleston Index used the sum of 19 weighted medical conditions to assess a patient's relative mortality risk. Zero to two points was low risk, three to four was moderate risk, and five or higher was high risk. Say next slide. They're, they're that okay, sorry. The Clavin classification scale is a validated system that grades perioperative complications of general surgery. Next slide. For postoperative complications, minor complications were classified at grades one to two. Next slide. Major complications were from grades three to five. Next. Five of the 42 patients were classified as high risk. 14 patients were in the moderate risk group and 23 patients were classified as low risk. Next. The median length of stay for our patients was eight days with a median ICU stay of two days. Mean operative times were broken down into the prone VATS, supine, and positioning times. Prone VATS was 108 minutes, supine was 230 minutes, and the positioning time, which included the initial placement into prone, as well as the change from prone to supine, was 90 minutes. Mean blood loss was 183 cc's, and 88% of the patients were able to be extubated on the day of their operation. Next. Postoperatively, 100% of the high-risk patients had a complication, three of which were major. 57% of the moderate-risk patients had a complication, three of which were major. And 74% of the low-risk patients had a complication, eight of which were major. As a reminder, a major complication ranged from anything requiring surgical, endoscopic, or radiological intervention up to and including death. Next. Predominantly, the complications were cardiopulmonary in nature, either in the form of cardiac arrhythmias or postoperative pneumonia. Five patients had a cervical anastomotic leaks. Two leaks required intervention, one via esophageal stenting, the other needed reoperation. There were three postoperative anastomotic strictures that required endoscopic dilation, two in the moderate risk group, one in the low risk group. Twelve of the 14 patients classified as having a major complication had either a history of or currently using tobacco. And there were two 30-day postoperative mortalities, one in the high-risk group from a necrotic conduit and tracheoesophageal fistula, and one in the moderate-risk group from a myocardial infarction. Next. Next slide. Thank you. In summary, our series supports the use of the prone MIE approach. Despite the facilitation of the thoracic portion of the surgery, which allowed for fewer ports and a pathway allowing early extubation, cardiopulmonary complications remained common. Using our preoperative modified Charleston comorbidity index, we found that our stratified higher risk patients had a higher rate of major complications. Using this index may be helpful in predicting possible postoperative complications for this patient population. Next. Thank you. <laughs> what, this uh, paper's open for questions. Uh, Michael. Uh, Michael Eady, New York. Uh, always great to see new approaches. Uh, I, 
you didn't report any interoperative problems with the prone position in terms of vascular injuries and, and catastrophes. Do you have a sort of a, an OR strategy for when that, if and when that occurs? Because that can be a very, a very troublesome. One of the criticisms of the prone position for esophageal surgery is, is what do you do if you have a disaster intraoperatively? Uh, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not aware of the of exact approach that we'd use. There were, have been no problems so far in the three year period that we report of any issues with the injury. The, the azagus vein is one of the vascular structures encountered is circled usually using a, like a laparoscopic finger instrument and then stapled the GI stapler early on in the surgery to try to avoid any vascular injuries. But I, I'm not aware of what our exact protocol is in that case. Ask a question here. I think one of the great frontiers of uh, esophageal surgery is reduction of complications. Um, and what you can do preoperatively is very important. So tell me a little bit about how you reduce the risk of, of uh, cardiopulmonary con um, complications in your smokers. Do you use beta blockers for the, uh, uh, to help prevent uh, atrial arrhythmias? And, and uh, what, what things might you recommend to this audience? Well, for smokers, obviously, any, any, any advice given to obviously stop smoking, they're, all patients are counseled if they are tobacco users to cease smoking, as we've seen, obviously, the higher risks and complications with the smokers. Um, again, using standard cardioprotective uh, evaluations as far as beta blockers, EKG involvement. Uh, it's been shown with esophagectomies that involvement in the chest cavity does lead to these uh, events. There were no preoperative beta blockers in specific for the MIEs. Um, they were treated kind of as the standard pathway for most surgical patients. Um, again, it's going to be for the tobacco, it's going to be more for counseling. Again, these patients are recommended to stop smoking as soon as the diagnosis is made, but some do not. Any other questions from the audience? Um, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you.